now we have a second session uh, on opportunities and challenges in hydrogen production, transportation, and storage. So we have four speakers for four speakers for this. Uh, we have Ms. Uh, Professor P. V. Arvind, Mr. from University of uh, Goringen, and we have Mr. Pawan Lukutala. He is the director, Heat Mobility Energy Technology at WRI, and then we have Mr. Sudhir Kumar Saxena. He is right now currently working as the Chief Administrative Officer, Indian Railway Organizations of Alternative Fuels. And Mr. Tom Joseph, he is the President of Bethlehem Hydrogen uh, Company based out in USA. So we will start with Professor P.V. Arvind. He will be speaking about hydrogen production advantages and disadvantages and the cost of production. And if I may uh, give a little introduction about uh, Professor. Professor is at the uh, PBR Wind is a professor at the University of Goringen, and he's a chair of energy conservation. He's involved in the supervision of research activities associated with the development of fuel cell systems. And he uh, runs a laboratory for hydrogen and fuel cell systems and supervises several PhD students in the postdoctoral researchers as well. And he also teaches courses on hydrogen fuel cell systems and thermodynamics in the University of Goring. Uh, Professor, uh, you have 10 minutes. Uh, let's briefly talk about the subject, then we will uh, move to next speaker, and then at last we can take some questions. Professor Premier, please. Thank you. So good morning, uh, everyone. So uh, today we'll, uh, we'll talk about hydrogen production and, and different options. Uh, based on actually what we do a bit, and then also extending it to uh, to to uh, what's what's happening uh, uh, in in other places in the world. So let me just first try to share my uh, presentation. Is it visible now? Uh, it has not yet come, but I think it's yeah. coming. So they might. Yeah, we can see your screen, Professor. Yeah. So, uh, So my uh, my presentation is about about about, uh, um, about uh, hydrogen uh, sorry hydrogen, uh, hydrogen production and uh, and and different methods and uh, and uh, uh, what we are doing in 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 uh, in Groningen and why uh, and, and then uh, how it's probably uh, useful in the Indian context. So um, if you look at uh, uh, hydrogen production. Uh, well, of course, it's all the, the interest in uh, hydrogen production is increasing because cheap renewable uh, electricity is becoming available more and more. So, uh, if you look at uh, the, the use of electricity, it will compete with direct use of electricity for many applications. But then, of course, uh, storage becomes very important. If you use solar panels, we have sunshine uh, during daytime, but we need storage for evening. But also, if you look at, say, from winter to, to, to summer, uh, seasonal storage is also important. So, storing uh, electrical energy is becoming important, and uh, and hydrogen technology uh, is is useful here. Now, uh, hydrogen uh, it's it's possible to produce hydrogen and use hydrogen directly. Uh, for example, uh, fuel cells, even combustion engines uh, for industry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's also possible to store hydrogen and and use for uh, power generation with large scale uh, hydrogen storage. And it's also possible to think of producing chemicals uh, using uh, with, with hydrogen as feedstock. But it's also possible to, to think of uh, hydrogen storage uh, with, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, say, ammonia production uh, and, and different uh, uh, hydrogen carriers. Ammonia is definitely emerging as one of the interesting uh, uh, hydrogen carrier, but also there are other, other uh, Options such as uh, fissure top fuels and, and methanol, et cetera, et cetera. So there are different rules to produce and, and utilize hydrogen. Now, hydrogen production uh, in general is, is uh, as of now, is mostly based on reform, reform of natural gas. Uh, 
But the electrolysis is also a non-technology. Alkaline electrolysis are used in industry, but are also there are new types of electrolysis coming. Some electrolysis. Uh, so these are also low temperature electrolyzers operating up, uh, say, slightly less than 100 degrees Celsius. And solid oxide electrolysis operating at very high temperatures. Um, uh, then, of course, reforming natural gas is, is known and, and widely used, but biogas reforming is also becoming uh, equally interesting, especially if you look at biogas production from waste streams. Uh, gasification, called gasification, uh, is, is one route. Uh, so, uh, biomass gasification, good, uh, including waste gasification, is a very interesting option, especially if you look at uh, green hydrogen production. Now, um, Groningen University, I work at University of Groningen uh, in the North Netherlands. And uh, as of now, Groningen is the largest natural gas field in Europe. So it's a, it's a, it's a energy hub. And there is an extensive international natural gas uh, supply network. And natural gas production is going to end quite soon. So what next? Um, large scale wind power production is thought of uh, from North Sea offshore wind turbines, uh, 100 gigawatt plus, uh, people talk about. And this could actually be uh, uh, connected with, uh, these this wind turbines could be used for very large scale hydrogen production because this region, uh, Groningen is already connected with uh, other parts of Europe with the natural gas pipelines. And it's possible to modify, modify these pipelines uh, to, to, to supply hydrogen to other places. So, uh, this uh, large scale wind production might lead to large scale hydrogen production. And then uh, there are several large scale hydrogen proje uh, projects. Uh, underground hydrogen storage is, is becoming very interesting. Salt carbons are there. And there is also a net zero initiative. And Groningen, Groningen is the first uh, hydrogen hub of uh, hydrogen valley of Europe. So it's a uh, large scale investments. Uh, uh, there are programs uh, and, and are, are starting up. The university. So I will talk a bit about what we do at university because any change of this nature should also be supported with knowledge activities. Uh, academia, knowledge, academia, industry, um, um, uh, cooperation is very important and uh, the setting up the knowledge infrastructure is also important. So uh, the universities, uh, other research institutes, uh, R&D, um, uh, um, uh, R&D sections of, of uh, companies, etc., all need to work together. So what we do, for example, uh, at the university to support this transition, uh, higher and fuel cell teaching programs, we really develop innovative uh, teaching programs working uh, together with other major players in Europe um, uh, in, in developing uh, hydrogen training programs. I will come to that. We look at, uh, uh, at the development of high efficiency systems, and well, system thermodynamics is used, chemistry and electrochemistry of, of these systems, electrolysis, reversible fuel cell systems, et cetera, for multiple applications, waste to, fuel, waste to energy, uh, aircrafts, uh, maritime transport, et cetera, et cetera. So we have activities planning uh, several areas. Ohio is, for example, a, a hydrogen uh, 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 technician training program we have developed. I have, uh, have coordinated this program with 14 organizations from different countries in Europe. And we train, we have developed an innovative training program with uh, traveling laboratories, uh, online um, uh, CDS games and, and online training. And we have trained around 800 technicians in Europe in one year in different countries, in different languages. And this is a blended mode training program. So we are now trying, we are now uh, planning to offer this uh, this, this program uh, in different countries in the world. So probably it's also interesting for uh, organizations in India to, to look at working with uh, the, the NOHAI consortium uh, in, in uh, imparting hydrogen uh, related training programs for, for technicians and engineers in India. This is another program called Teach High. Uh, so several uh, European organizations are working together to develop a, a European master program uh, full MS program to be taught at different universities in, in, in Europe. For example, if um, the hydrogen technology picks up in Europe by 2030, several tens of thousands of engineers are, are needed. And if you look at the facilities to train uh, hydrogen uh, fuel cell engineers, well, maybe there are 10, 20 universities. And if you look at these 20 universities, and if they take 50 master students each, and then probably uh, any year, 500 to 1,000 students, 10 years, 10,000 students. 
but the demand is for say 50,000 or more. So it's very important to, to develop large scale training programs. So we work with uh, several leading European organizations, universities in developing these programs, but also converting these programs for continuing and professional development for training engineers working in industry. And this part I lead as a part of this program. So the university is working with, uh, with other universities in Europe also offering in these courses, offering such courses uh, in Groningen. Research what we do, we look at electrochemistry to, to complete systems, uh, fully integrated systems. Um, so integrated systems, this is an example. So we have in the campus, this new um, center called HydroHub. This is one of the, the first centers anywhere in the world for testing very large scale electrolysis. Um, so in fact, we will soon have 250 kilowatt electrolysis, PEM and alkaline electrolysis systems. So the PhD research in my group is around modeling these systems in detail, thermodynamic modeling, and looking at entropy production in different components, and validating these models with actual op operation of large scale electrolysis, and then coming up with strategies for scaling up uh, these systems for efficient operation in the, in the future. So we work together with um, uh, University of Groningen and Hansa University of Applied Sciences, um, uh, and 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 in in, uh, in jointly supervising PhD research uh, uh, on on such topics. Professor, so, you have four. Yeah. Sorry. I said we have four more minutes for you. Okay. Professor. Thank you. So um, well, when you have um, hydro hub, uh, so what we are, what I have explained is we model the systems and try to validate the models. Modeling is done with system thermodynamics. Uh, thermodynamics tools, uh, for example, Aspen and, and Cycle Tempo, et cetera. We work with uh, University of Delft uh, together in this. And, and what we do with uh, system modeling is, uh, for example, this is uh, a concept which we have developed. It's a car as power plant. Now, if you have uh, your, your car, uh, so normally if you park somewhere, you have to pay for parking. In future, because if you have a fuel cell car with efficiency close to 40 or 50%, that's actually comparable to power production efficiency with large scale power plants anywhere in India or in Europe. So you might actually be able to, to, to rent out your engine as, as a power production unit. And so you drive to Cochin and park your car in a car park, you might actually get paid because uh, somebody else can actually make use of your fuel cell as, as a power production unit. Now, if you look at uh, such a system and, and system thermodynamics, if you use solid oxide fuel cells, we can actually use solid oxide fuel cells as a reformer. Now think of biogas produced from city waste. This biogas is available and we have a solid oxide fuel cell system. So uh, maybe we can uh, scrub, maybe we can take out CO2 from a biogas, uh, which uh, rather easy to introduce technologies. And uh, biogas reforming in a solid oxide fuel cell, producing electricity at the same time. And this reformed biogas is used for hydrogen production for cars. And we have shown that such a system uh, with a solid oxide fuel cell electrolyzer and a PEM fuel cell car. Uh, so the, 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 the fuel cell in a car to produce power, you could produce uh, electricity with say close to 60% efficiency, uh, which is comparable to combined cycle power plants, very large scale combined cycle power plants. If you, if you think of small scale power production, it's impossible to achieve such efficiencies with conventional systems. So, so this is another approach to produce hydrogen uh, locally and to, to utilize it. Uh, well, we look at electrochemistry, triple phase boundary reactions, and uh, and then the computational fluid dynamics combined with electrochemistry, et cetera, to come up with uh, new, uh, uh, well, understanding electrodes and, and using uh, such electrodes in, in coming up with efficient and easy to operate systems. And we also look at, for example, reversible solid oxide fuel cells. Now, the problem with electrolysis is that if you have an electrolyzer connected to a solar plant, you can operate, for, ex for example, five, six hours a day, and then uh, per year, maybe a couple of thousand hours. Now, imagine reversible uh, fuel cell systems, which we can use for power production when there is not enough electricity from solar systems or wind systems. And when there is excess electricity from solar systems or wind systems, we can actually use this uh, the same fuel cell in reverse mode as electrolyzer for producing power. What does it mean? This power plant or the, the fuel production unit will be continuously used 12 months a year uh, every day. Uh, so um, so the, the, the uh, capital cost 
component of energy produced will be will be much lower and and uh, solid so with high temperature uh, solid oxide fuels it is possible to to, uh, to to think of reversible operation and the round trip efficiencies could be close to 60 to 70 percent uh, much higher than uh, conventional routes of hydrogen production and utilization fuel cells so well, then we can think of ammonia, methanol, et cetera, for storage, long-term applications, also the fuel for transportation, et cetera. So this is also from another publication from our group on such a topic. We have actually uh, led the system development part of, uh, of a European project called Balance on reversing, on developing reversible solid fuel systems. But also we work to, together with, with, with uh, companies in the region in developing such, uh, such uh, reversible fuel cells based on innovative uh, system design concepts, which are easy to mass produce, for example, with injection molding using existing facilities, which might actually bring down the cost of fuel cell production significantly and, and uh, fuel cell electrolyzer or reversible systems production significantly. So these are some of the areas we work together. So if, uh, if I sum up uh, hydrogen production, so conventional hydrogen production is uh, based on uh, based on reforming, methane reforming, sorry that there's a typo. It's, it's based on methane reforming as of now. And uh, we, need to, 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 we need to shift to green hydrogen production. So electrolysis are required. Uh, electrically heated gasification and electrically heated reforming is also a, an option and an emerging technology, uh, but we need to, to, to develop such technologies. So um, alkaline technology is used in industry. PEM systems are fast emerging. Shell is now trying to, to set up one of the large PEM electrolyzers in Europe. Uh, several, uh, and, and solid oxide systems, um, large systems are slowly emerging. Say 100 kilowatt per couple of hundred, two, two, 300 kilowatt systems you can think of as of now. But of course, these systems are modular. So if you have a 100 kilowatt system, it's not very really difficult to, to, to build a 10 megawatt system by simply putting together, uh, say, 100, 100 kilowatt of our systems. Waste gasification and biogas reforming are also becoming increasingly attractive. And these technologies have the advantage that we might actually be able to take out a part of the carbon and store it somewhere, for example, for soil amendment and bringing down uh, well uh, the emission significantly and making even emission negative. So with such systems, we might be able to take out CO2 from atmospheric air and store somewhere, which is also probably important. Now, the cost targets uh, are, say, $1 to $3. Uh, it, it really depends. Uh, a large part of the cost will, a uh, significant fraction of the cost will come from cost of electricity. So if we, uh, and then uh, the, the cost of equipment. And, and um, uh, so uh, Reliance announced $1, $1 per, per uh, kilogram. And now, $1 to $3 per kilogram, I think we need, we need not worry too much about this. Imagine that we are paying for uh, one one uh, one liter of diesel, uh, maybe one dollar um, uh, in India, and the 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 IC engine efficiency is say close to twenty percent, and the calorific value is close to say forty megajoule per kilo, kilograms. For hydrogen, this is three times, and the efficiency of fuel cell is also well. Uh, it could be say double the well to wheel efficiency with fuel cells could be. Uh, say uh, is is uh, 30 40 percent when compared to 15 to 20 percent with with the conventional vehicles. Now, this actually means if you pay six times for the fuel, still it might actually make economic sense. So we don't need to worry probably too much about uh, the the cost of hydrogen because the numbers are are starting uh, to appear uh, very, very attractive already. And what we need to, to do is to get these systems uh, technologically perfected and bring to market in large scale. Thank you very much. That's all from my side. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, we will take the questions at the last of the, I mean, complete of this session. And uh, uh, please be with us for the complete session, Professor. And now we will uh, move to the second speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Pawan Mulukchula. He'll be speaking on strategies to make hydrogen fuel cell vehicle attractive in future. So, Pawan, as I already told, Pawan is a director of clean mobility and energy technology at WRI India and responsible for shaping the WRI India's clean mobility program. He's in charge of overall strategy and its implementation partnership and engagement, and he's leading team of researchers and technical experts 
at WRND on supporting government, both at the national and at the state level. Uh, thank you, Paman. Thank you for joining. Uh, we'll have 10 minutes for your session and we'll take elective questions at the last. Thank you so much. Yes, you please to start now. Sirish, can you see my screen? Yes, Paman, we can see your screen. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, I'm just going to present a short presentation on um, what is the opportunities for uh, application of hydrogen in the transportation sector and what needs to be, you know, and what can be done to really transition to a hydrogen economy. So I think one of the things to really understand um, is what have been the drivers for SUVs in the international markets? And I think that's a clue for India to really pick up from what has happened um, through the USA, where California is leading the ZEV program at 20, um, till 2024. And then the commercial vehicles emission reduction regulations by 2030 in European Union. In China, we have seen that um, the push for SUVs have been through strong subsidies and long term targets and Japan is transitioning into a hydrogen based economy uh, through multiple industrial sectors. So I think um, it's very clear that it has to be through a push um, through both regulation and uh, programs, which was already uh, which was also briefly discussed in the earlier session by Mr. Jyotila. And I think what is the role that we are talking about um, fuel cell um, electric vehicles in the context of which segment do they really apply? I think this is a little perspective to really talk about that. You know, yes, we see that their application is uh, as uh, in the four wheeler segment and all the way to the commercial vehicle segments where driving range becomes a critical point. And I think SUVs, we all know uh, this by now that, you know, it makes really a big impact and makes sense. In terms of just giving the global scenario uh, where it is, you know, it is estimated that there will be 1.5 million units by 2030, and this will be dominantly SUVs and CV um, and uh, commercial vehicles. And the adoption clearly has been due to government policies, incentives, and the need for hydrogen um, infrastructure. In Asia, um, we have seen Toyota and Hyundai uh, um, are expected to lead the market in the um, uh, car segment. And then post 2025, we see a huge uptake that will happen um, in the in this uh, market. There are currently about, as per 2020, about 500 hydrogen fuel, and you can see st refueling stations. And um, very clearly, it's based in Europe and um, in uh, the West Coast and the East Coast in the United States, and some in um, Japan and areas. And it's expected at least by the Hydrogen Council targets to have uh, 3000 filling stations. And uh, this graph just gives you a, a snapshot of the market that is expected. And I think there's a big room for India to play a role specifically in the transportation sector. Um, not getting into this, I think we all know the emissions from the transport sector and the need for um, moving to a cleaner uh, fuel uh, systems whether it is through electrification or through hydrogen based but the application clearly is in the heavy duty where there is very high utilization rates for different vehicles and it's also a challenge for the electrification in the evs bevs that due to weight of batteries and the charging times that it may not be attractive when we are talking about long distances, more than 500 kilometers, 2000 kilometers, and hydrogen fuel cell would have a very, very big role to play. What are the opportunities for the HFC vehicle uh, deployment? I think um, right now we clearly know that electric vehicles are primary choice due to the maturity. And uh, as we see supply side constraints in the LIB market also, hydrogen clearly is an opportunity there. And in India, we also see that very likely by 2040, there could be a balanced approach of um, BEVs, FCVs, uh, ICE in 2040. And um, commercial and long distance vehicles like delivery vans, urban transport uh, buses have a major role uh, when we're talking about the application in the transportation sector itself. Key benefits are fast refueling, longer lifespan, space efficiency and weight saving. 
and clean and safe handling of fuel cells in comparison to battery packs. I think these are some of the advantages in comparison to BEVs. But I think we all understand today it's a new technology, there's transition. And I think there's, of course, this lack of infrastructure. Uh, we need to put new infrastructure in place. Uh, there are some safety concerns also, and then cost constraints uh, currently because of high cost of capex for fuel cells and electrolyzers. In terms of policy support, I think it's been already mentioned. Uh, and just to reiterate, two things really need to happen. That you know something like um, fame to support today is not extended to um, uh, hydrogen fuel cell based vehicles, and it's very important that. Uh, that this segment be specifically included and specifically for buses you know kerala is um, moving ahead to really want to pilot the um, hydrogen uh, buses and i think it will be a good initiative to really have both national and state level uh, support and also we'll need formulating standards and codes for the hydrogen value chain in the transport sector itself um, also, what we have noticed is um, as part of the study that we were involved uh, with GIZ and other partners that I think the procurement process itself based on the experience of electric buses could be a lot more streamlined for hydrogen as well in terms of the structuring of um, balance tenders and doc contract documents, uh, bundling or unbundling of hydrogen refilling infrastructure and then financing and payment security. I think uh, these are a little bit of the nitty gritties that when we get into the procurement on how do we really learn the lessons from electric buses that India is deploying right now and what can we, uh, uh, how can that really help when we are talking about procuring hydrogen fuel cell buses. One interesting piece of work that we are doing with a couple of uh, folks who are also in this group with Mr. Ranudas, Mr. Bharat Salotra, Mr. Krishnan, uh, with a couple of them, um, is that we are also looking a potential for corridors. So we're kind of looking at a corridor level analysis uh, and we just have taken up this to really see what would be the feasibility for a corridor like uh, Delhi, Mumbai um, expressway, which is really coming up, which actually almost accounts for 50% of India's freight movement in the quadrilateral and how do we really start envisioning right now itself these as hydrogen corridors and um, we're looking at the feasibility and assessment and what kind of support policies would then be required I'm just giving a short snapshot of the framework which is still a uh, work in progress where we are looking at different operational parameters the infrastructure cost the efficiency and the standard specs to really come up with this kind of outputs of you know what would be the cost per turn kilometer the optimal range of vehicles where should be the location of fueling and charging stations and how would we really push for the financial viability of demand and cost of production and then come up with policy and incentive recommendations to really make this happen in india uh, this is just one last slide I want to touch and you know this will get into discussion and I think in terms of locations also uh, we really need to see where the energy is being generated right now. So when we talk about wind uh, we have onshore where Tamil Nadu is about 4 gigawatts, Gujarat is about 2 gigawatts and in solar we are talking about Rajasthan, Maharashtra, Telangana and Madhya Pradesh with 1 to 1.5 gigawatt. But also we can use the um, ISTS network or green energy corridor networks to be transported to where we can then place the electrolyzers and then can generate the production of hydrogen. So there are these parameters also that we will need to consider when we are thinking of application in the transportation sector about where to really generate um, and you know um, actually generate the hydrogen and where do we really need to transport it and where are we talking about in terms of the application itself for green hydrogen uh, in transportation sector. There's some numbers that we did in TCO, but not getting into details, but I think Anand will probably talk about it, um, that um, um, how hydrogen uh, compares to electric and you know what kind of policies will then help. I think that would be good uh, for more of a panel discussion and I'm happy to really talk about the kind of uh, programs and uh, subsidies and incentive schemes needed for uh, hydrogen uh, in transportation sector. Thank you. Uh -huh.
Thank you, Bhavan. Thank you so much for complete the session on time. We'll take all the questions at the end of the session, so please be with us for the time. And uh, now we, I'll, I'll invite Mr. Sudhir Kumar Saxena. Uh, Mr. Sudhir Kumar Saxena is a Chief Administrative Officer in the Indian Railways Organization of Alternative Fuels. Uh, he's involved in the spearheading of the introduction of alternative fuels energy efficient solutions in Indian Railways and is actively involved in the research on applications of CNG, LNG, biodiesels and other alternative fuels or fuels for Indian Railways. And as a part of research on alternative fuels, IRAOF has undertaken the ambitious research on use of fuel cells on locomotives where hydrogen will be the same source, of, uh, I mean, the main source of energy. Thank you, Mr. Sudhir Kumar Saxena, for joining us. And uh, we'll have 10 minutes for your presentation. And you, you can, I mean, you can put your presentation for, and we can have it. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh... Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think we are discussing a very important topic and the futuristic topic where we are uh, able to work out on a fuel, uh, mostly the green fuel, which will be coming up. So uh, um, uh, can, can I have a screen sharing, please? Can I have a screen share sharing, please? Sure. Sir. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Krishna, can you do that? So I sir, think. We... I, uh, sir, should I present it from our side? Uh, no, no. I want a screen sharing or. Uh... Sir, you can. You can. Uh, you so you will be able to share your screen. So it is enabled. Yeah, sir, I'll uh, sir, I'll share my screen. I have the yeah. presentation. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, basically, it's about uh, the hydrogen fuel cell train into the Indian railway system, and uh, we, as a part of the larger objective of the Indian railways, which states that uh, we have to, uh, in fact, the in, uh, entire India, that we have to go for zero carbon emission by 2047 into the country. Uh, Indian Railways is already aiming as a part of that uh, entire program. Like we want to go for 20 and by 2030, we want to go uh, complete green. So uh, we, in fact, have already started uh, a lot of. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, I think you can just start. So basically, it's a net zero carbon emission of Indian Railway as an entire system. And as you may be aware that uh, Honorable Prime Minister, during his address uh, to the nation during uh, this Independence Day of 15th, uh, uh, 15th uh, August, <clears throat> he has uh, stated that uh, Indian Railway will go completely green. Back, back slide, please. So basically, Indian Railways has set a target of becoming net zero carbon emitter by 2030. That's a larger objective on which we are trying to work. And hydrogen as an uh, entire ecosystem can be uh, probably can play a major role in achieving uh, a major role into achieving this our target for this. So how, what are the initiative basically green energy initiative which has been taken to achieve the zero carbon emission by Indian Railways? First target is about setting up the 100% electrification of railway network. So we want to eliminate uh, the diesel operation on the main line and so that we can switch over with the uh, power, uh, with the electricity, electric power. Then we are having sourcing the green power from the solar, wind, hydro, and including a storage system. So there is a large scale program for harnessing green power for uh, running all our trains uh, with, the electric, uh, with the electric, which will be drawn from the uh, green power. Uh, we are working largely on this system because uh, you know, Indian Railway is having a vast land uh, which is available, vacant land is available, and we have a capacity of almost 20 gigawatt capacity. So where if we are able to uh, keep this hydrogen, we are able to uh, store the hydrogen from the solar generation, then uh, probably we can be able to achieve a lot of success in achieving the zero carbon emission uh, using the hydrogen system as well. So uh, next, and energy, back sorry, please. 
back back so energy efficiency measures are some other things where we are trying to work then uh, large scale uh, this um, we are having the use of hydrogen for diesel driven rolling stock whatever are the rolling stock which are left over we will be trying to convert them into uh, into the hydrogen and uh, we will try to run with that hydrogen next please next please so the key statistics of indian railway is we are having a total route length of 64859 km and we have almost 45000 route kilometers has been electrified out of this and we have an ambitious target of converting the entire electrification by uh, 20 uh, december 2023 we have the locomotive of uh, 6800 uh, electric locomotives at at present and 5900 diesel locomotive which will be phased out gradually and they will be converted into the electric traction we also have multiple units which are operating uh, basically uh, 2555 uh, and 5 uh, electrical multiple unit we have uh, then uh, mainline emus of 929 we have uh, 2300 almost uh, diesel electric multiple unit out of which we have 548 diesel power cars we have other major diesel vehicles of 762 uh, tower cars which are used for the maintenance of the overhead equipment so uh, next so this is what is what is the application to the transport sector I means it's all i think uh, have been uh, has been covered in the past discussion and the elaboration in the presentation i'll be focusing mainly on the uh, in the uh, railway part that what are the efforts and what are we trying to do next please so you know the first word first hydrogen train was launched by the uh, coradia island that was uh, the first train developed by elsom uh, and it's running uh, since uh, 2016 and it has converted it has covered uh, quite a lot of kilometers and is running successfully they also are having a phase 2 program of the uh, almost running an additional 40 new trains by 2022 so uh, next uh, there are few more uh, item basically you know the hydroflex uk they are uh, they are developing this hydrogen fuel cell train siemens are developing uh, hydrogen fuel cell train so i will be now coming to the indian railway part that what are the effort basically is a very few limited experiences available right now into the uh, into the world worldwide but yes we have taken as a challenge and we are trying to work on the hydrogen fuel cell train uh, the uh, we have identified two pilot project uh, where we are using uh, will be using the hydrogen as a fuel and replacing the diesel uh, one of the project is about uh, replacement of uh, the existing diesel power car with the hydrogen fuel cell based train we are having uh, the capacity of each train is 1200 kilowatt uh, is the project where we will be providing two uh, diesel power car which will be uh, running uh, with the hydrogen and this first train will be operating from sonipat to jin section of haryana and uh, the second project which we are trying to look forward is about the narrow gauge locomotive where we are running the uh, train from kalka to shimla which is right now uh, running with the diesel operation where we would like to convert into a uh, fuel cell based train so that it has environmental benefit as well as the uh, economical benefit also that's what we are just trying next please so th this is the pilot project first is about the sonipat jin section uh, it's a distance is about 89 km uh, it will having it will have 12 halts and uh, it is a mix of the uh, hydrogen fuel cell capacity of 800 kw Uh, along with the lithium ion batteries which will be having a 400 kilowatt capacity so it can be we have left this to the optimal mix to the developer that in whatever way they want to provide they can uh, change this mix of uh, capacity of hydrogen fuel cell and the uh, battery uh, uh, ratio so the approximate requirement of hydrogen will be about 400 kg uh, per day so that means we will be needing about 1 kg uh, per kilometer of operation as in case we need almost 4 to 4 and a half uh, diesel liter of uh, diesel oil is required for running of 1 km uh, of a train so uh, we already have gone ahead we have invited the bid for uh, this uh, case and uh, the bid in bid has been invited on 27th of uh, um, july and the opening date is on 25th of uh, november 
we already held held a previous conference where we had a larger participation a lot of interest has been shown by many manufacturers and uh, other thing including uh, the siemens uh, elsom then bhel and uh, the other uh, big players have shown a lot of interest into this uh, development of this train <clears throat> next so this the scope of this work is because we already have gone into a tendering stage so what we wanted uh, it has to have uh, onboard equipment where we just want uh, a fuel cell kit including its design development etc it is on the two diesel power car the combination if you see at the bottom of the graph bottom of this uh, diagram so uh, uh, left side is one unit the right side is the another unit the both end is the driving uh, and where which is which is basically a diesel power car and it's right now running with the diesel so we want to replace this diesel engine and associated uh, equipment with the diesel with the fuel cell and the battery set uh, so uh, this is a combination of one diesel power car plus uh, four trailer coaches so this this is a one combination and the other side is uh, the same combination so basically it's a 10 car rig where we have uh, two diesel power car and the eight trailer coaches which is carrying the passengers so this this is a, what is a combination and in fact to achieve it in a, uh, in its uh, uh, in its uh, entirety what we have done is that uh, we have kept the hydrogen stationary hydrogen storage and the filling station as a part of this uh, contract itself so there is no hiccups in uh, supplying the entire uh, chain and uh, another thing also we have kept it that the supply of hydrogen is also a part of this bit itself so that whenever a, a, a bidder or developer is coming so he can uh, do the entire thing together he, he has not to dependent upon anyone and uh, so after a period of 6 months trial we will take it over we will try to work on that another aspect of this is that we have kept uh, the annual maintenance contract for a period of 3 uh, years after a warranty of 2 years so that means for a 5 years period he will be maintaining the entire rake and uh, whatever replacement or whatever teething troubles will be anticipated so he'll be able to do that so we are just thinking on that line and then we are already have gone ahead so that's a specific uh, small uh, diagram depicting uh, your what what could be the configuration of the uh, fuel cell train next uh, if you just see at the layout basically indicative layout so what we are planning is that hydrogen storage can be at the top and then fuel cell module can be in the center along with the battery modules then we have a traction converter inverter depending upon because uh, it needs a lot of space so we have to decide whether we can provide the traction converter inverter underslung or we can go on board it will all depend upon the later designing stage and that we have left it to uh, the successful bidder that in whatever way he want to design we will just be going ahead on that next please so that was the project and the second pilot project which we are talking about as i have told you initially that's for the kalka shimla route where we will be running uh, 96 uh, km is a distance and uh, the altitude also of course kalka altitude is 656 and shimla is 2276 so i don't know impact of hydrogen storage at shimla we want at the other end then it has to be seen that in, in what manner we have to do it uh we uh, we are going for conversion of two existing narrow gauge locomotive for kalka shimla section to hydrogen train from uh, the diesel locomotive we conducted an expression of interest in december 2000 and we also got a quite a encouraging response into that uh, we are firming up the uh, uh, functional requirement specification the challenges into it is coming because it's a narrow gauge system where the width of the uh, locomotive is less so we are not able to find a proper storage space for the hydrogen into this so we we are in fact working out a different um, options that in what manner we should try to cover this and what way we can try to maximize the space available into this uh, the uh, the uh, this after this conversion into the hydrogen uh, fuel cell and then optimization has to be done uh, on this two pilot lo uh, location because this narrow gauge section which is a hilly terrain this will remain unelectrified because that will uh, we we think that we it will take a very long time because that will continue to remain uh, operation operating on the diesel on the diesel fuel uh, because of the channel the challenges of the tunnel part etc where we cannot find much of electrical clearances on to uh, the conversion and the terrain is also very difficult so we will be continuing for a longer time 
so uh, next so we have broadly we have almost 52 locomotives in a different section uh, most of you must have traveled into these sections because these are very uh, scenic uh, kind of a sections like the kalka shimla is 96 then we have a new jalpaiguri to darjeeling section uh, the neral mathiran near pune then Uti section is there, then Pathan Kot, Joginder Nagar is there. We also have a, a few more smaller sections, but these are the broader and larger sections where the locomotive strength is almost uh, 52 numbers, so which we definitely will be going ahead onto this uh, kind of uh, locomotive, which will, will be going for the hydrogen fuel cell, uh, considering all kind of environmental advantages, and also from the heritage consideration, because some of the section has been declared as a heritage also, what heritage are there, so we have to go ahead on that. Next, please. So uh, what is the way forward? We uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, scope for the future. Uh, uh, this, uh, um, the, the pilot project is about the diesel electrical multiple unit, which uh, uh, in the long run, we will keep it as an emergency vehicle because uh, once we are having the complete electrification, so we'll have a limited requirement of uh, the hydrogen-based uh, uh, mainline fuel cell trains. Uh, but uh, we will be having, of course, as I told you, the narrow-gauge locomotives, the hilly terrain uh, locomotives, which will definitely be converted into hydrogen fuel cell. Then we are running with the power car for the hotel load on Rajani and Shatabdi train, which, uh, uh, which are provided at the uh, next to the engine and the, at the end of the uh, train. So this, this is provided for running of the uh, air conditioning load. So there we can try to convert them into all this power car can be converted into a hydrogen fuel cell train. The shunting locomotive, which are being used at the terminal stations for shunting of our shunting operation of the coaches. So there we can just try to work uh, and we can try to uh, calculate. Uh, we try to go to the uh, hydrogen uh, fuel. And probably that will be Filling that will go gel uh, with the entire hydrogen ecosystem because uh, if we are having a lot of development, as is being told, that we are giving a lot of uh, electrolyzer capacity into the country, storage will be there. Could be the hydrogen uh, pipeline, could be another concept which has been talked about. So, all that, uh, if th that becomes true, so probably we can try to work all the shunting locomotives in that area, we can go green into the metro like Delhi, Calcutta, all the four metros. <clears throat> we can go green with the hydrogen uh, fuel cell shunting locomotives. Then, as I told you that we have a uh, diesel operated tower cars, which are being used for the OG maintenance. There also we can convert them into a hydrogen fuel, which are being used for the emergency operation. Uh, once there is a failure of for the overhead wire for the train operation, so this they come into the picture. A very important aspect is about the energy storage solution, and uh, I think a lot of has a lot of, has been discussed uh, by the previous speakers and the previous uh, uh, um, uh, previous persons. So, where what we want that you know, as I told you, that we have a capacity and a lot of vacant land is available, which has a potential of almost 20 gigawatt of solar capacity. We are not able to harness the entire capacity because. Uh, because the requirement, uh, the total capacity is much more than our peak requirement. The peak requirement of railway at the end of say 2030, we expect almost uh, by 24, 25, it could be somewhere around uh, 4 to 5,000 megawatt. Uh, so once we have say 4 to 5,000 megawatt of a capacity, uh, peak capacity and the solar capacity is uh, 20,000 megawatt, we will not be able to compensate the hydrogen storage can uh, hydrogen storage or uh, the battery storage can find definitely can provide a pathway uh, to the indian railways that we can go ahead for a large scale energy storage solution and uh, hydrogen probably being a green solution can be very effective and uh, as you know the project i am talking about the uh, sonipat jin section we will be running this uh, diesel uh, will be running this hydrogen first uh, hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cell train so there we have the vacant land, we can provide the solar there, then we can have the uh, electrolyzer uh, then and there itself, we can generate the hydrogen, we can use uh, then and there itself. So the advantage with the railway is that we uh, we are uh, we, we can be a producer, we can be uh, uh, we can be a storage solution, we can be uh, we can be a user also. So all those things are basically in in one basket and we can 
we don't have to go anywhere for this uh, kind of a system so we can have the entire ecosystem of a hydrogen at one place and we can try to use it uh, another application of hydrogen could be like we have a diesel generator set at the railway stations where which we are trying to uh, use it in case of emergency operation once the, the power is not there it is being used for that so the hydrogen fuel cell uh, based generation can be one of the good option uh, uh, can be a very good option in future next please so now uh, some of the challenges of course uh, i know uh, the industry has taken up and they are well seized with the matter and we and they are working on that and i am sure that in next uh, four to five years probably whatever challenges we are thinking at present it will not be there uh, as uh, amitabh khan sir has show, uh, told in the morning that the solar prices if you simply see that the solar prices were in the range of 16 17 rupees per unit initially once it has started it has dropped down to say 1.99 uh, per unit so now the same way that that kind of a transi uh, transition we are anticipating into the hydrogen space also so with this large scale uh, application and with the demand generation this uh, will be an achievable ta achievable target and uh, but there are certain challenges like uh, make in india compliance which uh, i think that everybody has to go over, particularly from the government we have to go for the make in india compliance uh the major part component of the fuel cell uh, hydrogen fuel cell base hydrogen train are fuel cell then the battery and the storage uh, these are the theme, uh, three major important aspect where we need to uh, have this uh, indigenous manufacturing capacity has to be available means i am really happy to learn that uh, fuel cell manufacturers the efforts have been started and we are in the process of almost going ahead into that so uh, the battery manufacturing could be the another aspect where probably we have to go on a larger scale in future to be more competitive and the storage of course uh, the once the demand is there definitely lightweight um, storage solution for the like the uh, carbon based storage will be there storage tank will be there and uh, so that that that's what is required uh, and the higher cost of operation because if the fuel cost right now it has been Uh, quoted at uh, hydrogen fuel cost is being quoted as almost in the range of 600 to 700 rupees for uh, the uh, blue hydrogen and if you talk about the green hydrogen itself so it's almost touching 900 to 1000 rupees per kg so the, the cost becomes very prohibitive for if we go on a larger scale if we want to scale up the operation we need to contain the cost then uh, not only the higher cost of operation we have to do the maintenance cost also because the fuel cell will require the replacement but the technology which is being talked about uh, recently that we have a reversible kind of a hydrogen fuel cell which can you which can be used as a fuel cell as well as electrolyzer so that reversible cycle will probably reduce a lot of cost uh, for the future operation because the fuel cell life cost is also uh, will be a prohibitive factor because it has a certain life of operation after that you have to replace the replace them and it has a uh, sizable uh, amount of the cost Uh, transportation of hydrogen if you are not able to uh, generate at the site itself in c2 then you have to go uh, you have to uh, transport the hydrogen that uh, there's of course is a big uh, challenges and the storage at a high wire pressure of say 100 bar that is a big challenge where probably we need uh, to have the approval of peso for all kind of uh, higher vessels uh, higher capacity vessels so that will be has to be in place uh, in quick succession otherwise our uh, targets of hydrogen switching over to hydrogen on a large scale will probably will be deferred and uh, on board safety measures will be of course that will be a challenge because we'll be carrying a lot of passengers into the train so all those safety measures has to be taken into account and then we have to uh, cater for it um, so uh, that that's one thing uh, one more constraint which we are right now uh, experiencing is that the low range of operation due to the uh, low to the space constraint Uh, for hydrogen storage because uh, either you have to have a hydrogen filling station in midway or you can uh, have a higher storage so that you can go on a longer way uh, but that's something we were coming with the uh, carbon uh, fiber uh, storage tank probably provide uh, to some solution to that extent it can provide some uh, solution to this so thank you i think uh, uh, this is what we are trying to do for the indian railways to turning uh, indian railways into a green uh, green 
railways and to have zero carbon emission to achieve the zero carbon emission by 2030 thank you thank, thank you mr sachena for the wonderful insights and what indian railways all doing uh, we will take this few questions at the end so i just request you please you. be with us for some time and we will now quickly move to mr tom joseph uh, actually this session was initially planned with the mr anand vasudevan but due to certain issues and reasons he, he could not join and i mean cannot give the presentation so on his behalf mr tom joseph will be giving us so mr tom is the president of bethlehem hydrogen technology and it is a technology solution provider for hydrogen generation compression and dispersion he has a total 40 plus years of industrial experience including 30 years with the hydrogen industry uh, uh mr tom so we will take uh, 10 minutes and uh, please uh, if you can uh, speak about uh, the challenges related to storage and the transportation so thank you thank you uh, thanks for that uh, kind introduction i would definitely keep it uh, short and um, uh first of all uh, once again um, uh, good afternoon to all our participants in this uh, workshop uh, thanks to the organizers to uh, provide a forum uh, to discuss about some of the challenges faced by the industry in our uh, dream to get the uh, energy independence for for the country i'm really honored truly honored to invite based in usa and truly honored to uh, do this workshop from our offices here in pushi Uh, I'm proud to say that uh, for the last uh, five years, the hydrogen um, solutions that are going from Bethlehem Hydrogen to the United States customers are actually going from Fuji. I have a team uh, supporting me from here uh, uh, in Fuji, and uh, so that is the office I'm working from. And uh, just to give a background, my personal background, and as I, as you heard, I have about 42 years of experience in hydrogen. And that also started right here in Kochi. You know, my first experience or first job was with um, uh, ammonia plant at uh, Ambermead uh, fertilizer plant. And then uh, fast forwarding, you know, my connections with Kerala started uh, with the ISRO, the first set of uh, liquid hydrogen containers that came to ISRO back in 1993. Uh, was actually designed by me and manufactured by Air Products. I was an Air Products employee. and uh, we, i was fortunate to be involved in that project and then uh, of course before my initial premier products in 2009 i was instrumental in uh, in the amblemate um, air product facility during the project development phase so that is uh, some uh, data points before i get, jump into the uh, presentation here the topic that was assigned to me uh, can you see my screen here uh your screen is currently frozen no uh, we cannot see it right now okay let me let me just start something uh how are you now uh do you want us to uh put the presentation it says it is presenting uh it's a little quick presentation very short one yeah we can see now okay maybe maybe the network uh, delays all right so my and topic here uh, is on uh, uh, challenges related to hydrogen storage and transportation okay and i will keep it as uh, uh, focused on hydrogen we can actually indian um, you know the emergence what happened to this appear again is it still on screen uh, uh my colleague has shared the screen you can speak but i think uh, tom you can uh, keep your mic off there's some uh, disturbances uh, i believe there is some connection issues with your on your side so you can keep your mic off so that there are video i'm sorry the video off i'm so sorry oh the video okay how how, how about it now yeah we can hear you please okay the the first page you know if if you are uh, seeing the presentation there the first page talks about the hydrogen storage uh, typically the hydrogen is stored in um, you know three states the number one uh, the liquid state you know so i'm i'm bringing in the liquid storage uh, into my presentation uh, because ultimately um, if the indian Uh, technology uh, you know this market is heading towards large volumes of um, uh, 
um, hydrogen handled for the fuel cell applications or even for uh, you know power plant applications um, we need to start thinking about uh, liquid you know we don't need to do anything in the near term but in the long long term uh, the liquid need to be thought of because um, you know of the, of the physical properties of hydrogen um, later on you will see uh, in a gaseous mode transport you are mo mostly transporting steel not hydrogen so that is why I brought in this, uh, you know, few bullets on on um, uh, on liquid. But um, as you can see, it is a cryogenic liquid. You know, um, it is stored at minus 253 degrees Celsius, and the process is really energy intensive to liquefy hydrogen. And um, um, the second, you know, some, some of the bullets there, you know, the, what we need to be worried about when you are talking about cryogenic hydrogen is. Uh, the boil of losses. You know, when it is um, when you are talking about minus 253 uh, degrees Celsius, when the ambient is about 45, so you can immediately do the math in your mind, uh, in your head. Um, it's about 300 degrees Celsius delta, and there will be a lot of heat leak going into the into the into the hydrogen, and then boiling off uh, the you know the liquid into gaseous state. Uh, um, state. And one of the challenges India will have initially uh, is the manufacturing technologies for uh, for the liquid hydrogen containers and um, and the transportable you know uh, vehicles, um, because um, it's a different technique than uh, liquid oxygen or liquid argon or liquid, you know, any of the atmospheric gases, liquid nitrogen. There are a lot of companies here producing um, cryogenic containers that could uh, hold uh, liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen. But when it comes to the hydrogen and helium, because of the you know the the temperature challenges and also the boil off challenges. The technology is really different, so that will be some of the challenges we need to face uh, down the road for uh, you know for liquid hydrogen storage. Uh, the second set I have in the presentation is the hydride, you know, the hydrogen stored in form of hydride. Uh, there are a lot of research still going on around the world, including some of the Indian universities. Um, it's no, it is not um, uh, economically you know uh, feasible or viable yet. Um, these are all under development. And the main problem there right now is the energy efficiency and uh, also the life cycle of um, uh, materials. And again, um, this is um, this is the R&D forum, and um, I don't want to you know, uh, take up the time in this uh, in this forum uh, to talk about that. But if down the road, uh, that could be, uh, especially the chemical hydride, might be uh, one of the attractive modes of uh, storing and transporting hydrogen. Uh, because then you can transport hydrogen almost similar to what, you know, what we are doing for uh, petrol or diesel today. Uh, but that technology is not here yet. And the most uh, popular mode of uh, storage here in India uh, will be the, in, in the near future, will be the high pressure gas storage. Uh, as as uh, uh, some of the presenters mentioned earlier, uh, the production of hydrogen either through steam and reforming uh, or through elect electrolysis. Uh, produces hydrogen anywhere from you know six bar to you know 15 bar pressure, and um, hydrogen being a very light gas at those pressures, the energy density that could be stored within a volume uh, is very very small. So because of that, the industrial gas companies or the users um, will uh, compress that to much higher pressures. Now, when it comes to the fuel cell um, industry. Uh, some of the pressures uh, we are talking about, you know, is uh, number one, the 200 bar. Of, you know, in, in India, it is about 165 bar transportation. I just plugged in 200 bar because that is uh, available in the US. Uh, but um, in India, it is about 165 bar, you know, current transporting system. Now, uh, I think Mr. Jodhilal mentioned about the peso approval for higher pressures. You know, what we need, if we are going forward with the um, you know, fuel cell program here, not not that if, you know, as we are going forward with the fuel cell programs here, uh, what we need is the approval for uh, 500 bar and even 900 bar, because for dispensing uh, 700 bar fuel into a Toyota Mirai or any of the fuel cell cars, you need the storage at 900 bar. That is what the industry needs. Are, you know. So the PESO should be working on organizations like PESO should be working on approving uh, these higher pressures like 500 and 900 bar and of course you know as it goes uh, you know goes up uh, there will be uh, safety concern and engineering concerns like um, hydrogen embrittlement uh, but all these uh, these are manageable and um, um, again another um, 
data point I would like to share is that um, I am a member of a technical committee writing codes NFPA2 for, you know, for the NFPA2 is the hydrogen code that is recognized throughout the throughout the world and I am one of the um, 32 uh, uh, technical committee members. Uh, we started developing the codes and standards from 2006 for this industry and from the day one onwards I am in there. Uh, so there are um, you know, mitigation um, um, programs already identified. I think you know, we can embrace those things and get these things approved here um, in uh, in India. And of course, the the stove. When, uh, when you talk about the challenge related to the storage, you, know, you need to be worried about the purity levels. You know, they, because the fuel cell needs very high fuel uh, purity levels for of hydrogen. The fuel cell, as some of you may know, is a dead end technology. You know, meaning the hydrogen goes in. But there's no gas outlet from the fuel cell, you know. So any impurities, all the hydrogen within that uh, uh, gas stream gets converted to water and electricity. But any impurities will get accumulated within within the membranes, um, and then that is going to be affecting the life of the of the membranes. Um, so the, the gas, gas purity is a very critical thing. So because of that, there are certain Technologies um, identified for compressing the gas are from uh, from 10 bar or 15 bar all the way to the pressure they have on the screen. Uh, moving to the second slide, please. The second slide talks about uh, uh, challenges related to the hydrogen transportation. Uh, uh, you know, again in general and then specific to India. Um, if you're talking about the cryogenic liquid transportation, which is very popular in the United States and in the US, we have um, about uh, very close to 300 tons per day uh, liquid liquefier capacity between all the all the major uh, companies like the Lindy and um, Air Products and Air Liquid and you know the play, other small players. Uh, so what we you know, for the distributed uh, for hydrogen distribution, we normally rely on um, on the liquid you know, liquid tank. And uh, so the liquid trailers, and that is exactly what you what you see on the upper right corner there, an air products trailer delivering uh, to a liquid liquid uh, storage tank, um, you know, next to it. That vertical tank is the liquid storage tank. I specifically picked this uh, photo uh, to show this was the first commercial project in the United States, and I actually was the you know business development manager uh, for that project. This was. At in a, uh, at a, a tire manufacturing facility in uh, Tennessee, uh, Bridgestone Firestone, and we installed that in um, in 2006. On July 1st, 2006, that was commissioned. Um, so you can imagine, it's a 15-year-old um, uh, technology. The technology has gone through multiple iterations after that, uh, but this is something which we are doing for the last uh, 15 years uh, in, on a commercial basis. Um, but the disadvantage of the uh, cryogenic um, transportation is it's very capital intensive. And earlier in the day, uh, somebody was throwing some numbers on the fuel cell best price. You know, that that liquid, liquid hydrogen trailer sitting there is going to be almost the same price as the um, as the fuel cell bus. Um, so you can imagine, you know, for, for setting up a network of trailers, it is a very capital in intensive infrastructure. So until Unless the the demand increases here, and unless there is um, you know um, need for it, um, I don't see anything like that coming here uh, in the immediate future. But ultimately, that needs to come because that is why I am getting into the next set of bullets, and the gas distribution at 165 bar. Um, today, most of the you know the hydrogen distribution happening in India is using the cylinder caskets, and if you see that red painted. Um, set of cylinders on top of the of the lorry or trailer. Um, that is what the cylinder cascades. That is how the hydrogen is transported in India today. And I have you know, mentioned in the bullet that carries somewhere around um, 150 kilograms of hydrogen at 165 bar. And for a uh, for a refueling uh, facility, the usable hydrogen may be around maybe only around 100 kilograms. So. Now you do the math. You know when when I look at a truck, you know from the nearest uh, um, for you know distribution center, uh, when it comes to the dispensing station, it is bringing 100 kilograms of hydrogen, and the rest of it is simply steel. And this is true even in the United States. You know, we in the United States we carry them in uh, two trailer fleets, and you can see 
the lower left uh, photographs, you know, the two of them, the two photographs I included there, one front and the back side. And those two trailers, which carries about uh, 180 to 200 bar hydrogen, uh, they carry about 300 kilograms of hydrogen. Even then, it, the rest, 19,700 kilograms is simply steel, the, 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 the type one cylinder uh, that is being hauled around on the, on the road. Because of that, we normally limit the gaseous distribution in the United States for less than about 300 kilometers, uh, because it is not economical to go beyond that. We, we rely on uh, liquid distribution for longer distances, and for shorter distances, uh, we rely on the gaseous distribution. And I'm very uh, delighted to hear uh, from you know, Mr. Jodilal that you, what you are considering is a hub and spoke arrangement, and that is exactly what is needed in India, especially in the initial days when the distribution um, is going to be in the gaseous form. Uh, you need to have distributed generation of um, hydrogen and then have hub and spoke arrangements so that uh, you are not hauling uh, just steel all the way around the country and you know, just uh, keep it less than uh, 300 to 200 kilometers you know, distribution uh, network. Um, then um, there are challenges related to the current infrastructure. I mentioned the current infrastructure is mainly um, the cylinders and cascades. Uh, but you, we need to have larger volume uh, infrastructure developed. And then the last but not the least in that group of um, bullets, the safety awareness of the public. You know? So when it comes to, when you talk about India, you know, since I am familiar with the, you know, both the US and Indian uh, social fabric, uh, the safety awareness need to be improved here and now in India. Uh, compared to what, you know, then only these kinds of flammable gas can be safely transported um, in, uh, in, 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 in Kerala or in India, um, anyway. So there, there is, I mean, we should have um, education, uh, the public education. Uh, there's no, there no need for a large crowd to be at any, every accident site. There should be people, uh, emergency responders, and there should be people responsible for that, addressing emergencies. But especially when a flammable gas is uh, a vehicle involving uh, flame of gas gets into an accident. There's no reason for you know public to accu uh, you know, accumulate there, and then for you know, uh, for if some unfortunate incident happens, multiple people getting affected. And that kind of uh, public awareness need to be in increased, especially for high pressure hydrogen transportation. Because if that uh, hydrogen, let us say there is a hydrogen trailer uh, at uh, you know, 500 bar, you know going over the road and then getting into an incident, and if there is a leak. That hydrogen jet is going to be, you know, uh, going to be traveling about 50 feet, uh, 50 to 100 feet, um, with in, you know, flammable, uh, maintaining the flammable range and causing the um, safety hazard to the public. Um, so even though the industry is uh, it has certain safety measures in place, uh, still accidents could happen. So that is where the safety awareness of the public should be, you know, much better. Uh, than today, uh, when as we get you know get going with this uh, hydrogen distribution network, uh, the, the last uh, slide talks about um, some few additional you know challenges in the gas distribution. What you know what we need to you know, uh, do here in India. Um, again, a couple of presentations earlier you know, mentioned about indigenization, Indian manufacturing of the storage uh, systems. You know, there are, the, the the most economical solution for large pressure distribution will be uh, the type three or type four tanks. And people who doesn't know what are the different types I am mentioning here. Type ones are you know, typical uh, steel cylinders, and type threes are um, you know, cylinders with uh, metallic liner inside and then carbon fiber wrapping around them. And then type four is what I have in the you know, lower bottom. Actually, type three is what I have on the lower left side. And then type four is what I have in uh, on the you know, lower you know, right corner there. Uh, type four tanks are much cheaper, are much uh, lighter, not cheaper, but much lighter. And um, they carry larger volume. You know, the trailer you see there is actually carrying only uh, 200 bar hydrogen, but there are type four tanks uh, which are designed for uh, 500 and even 900 bar you know, uh, carrying capacity. Those technologies should be brought into India and then manufactured here. 
and so that so that it becomes more economically viable for the Indian market uh, to get into this uh, this technologies uh, in a big way. Uh, so those are the, some of the um, you know points I wanted to throw in uh, just for a uh, thought here, and um, that is the end of my presentation. I will be more than happy to. Um, answer and share you know, my knowledge from the last uh, 30, 40 years uh, in terms of safety, in terms of hydrogen handling, in terms of uh, uh, refueling. Um, again, uh, I will conclude that I am proud to uh, make everyone aware that um, Kochi is the center of uh, uh, hydrogen refueling infrastructure as port uh, for the U.S. market uh, for the last five years. And thanks for providing me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Tom. So we. We already have passed time, so we'll quickly take one or two questions. Uh, we'll quickly try to finish in the next five minutes. So, uh, Somit in the starting had made one query regarding the upskilling and the pre training of the existing of uh, existing uh, man uh, manpower required. I would also like to add one thing more into it. Uh, the 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 trainings related to the safety as well. So, uh, uh, Professor Arvind, if you can answer quickly, answer related to it, the, what kind of trainings actually would also be uh, possibly required for the uh, uh, for the professionals related to safety trainings for for use of these kind of things? Uh, well, um, it's not an easy question to answer. Uh, well, within, uh, for example, the Teach High program we 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 develop in in, in Europe as uh, a part of the uh, master uh, European master program on air and fuel cells. Uh, uh, to be offered in different countries. So, there is one module on uh, hydrogen safety, and um, uh, so there is also a uh, University of Ulster is is really one of the the uh, center of uh, uh, expertise. And what is important is uh, well to develop such uh, such knowledge centers here in India, and uh, all work together with such knowledge centers uh, in in other countries. And start uh, offering training programs to 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 large number of uh, technicians, engineers, but also policymakers. And safety training is is in, in general probably well something I think uh, uh, needs to be taken up seriously in India when hydrogen is introduced. And it doesn't mean that in, hydrogen is inherently less safe when compared to other fuels when it's properly handled. But uh, large scale training programs, it's very important to think of. Thank you. Thank you, Arvind. Uh, uh, Mr. Saxena, if I may uh, ask you, uh, Mr. Jyotiral has also asked about if the if we can try fuel cell in the high speed trains as well as done in EU. And the second question Lagu wanted to ask is, uh, like, what is the in-house capacity and in IR uh, skills that Indian railways have developed can be used for the road based transportation system as well? As I told you that we are going for uh, the large scale electrification. So uh, whatever is remaining as a diesel operation after the electrification and particularly the narrow gauge uh, section, where will we be switching over to all? Uh, we'll be planning to switch over to the hydrogen fuel cell based train. So that's what is the ob objective. And the other we have other vehicles also, which are uh, the rolling stock, what we call them as a rolling stock. Uh, onto the train uh, that we will be covering up. So that's the larger scale which we just try to convert it. Uh, in the transportation, uh, role of transportation, probably once the hydrogen transportation takes place, would be uh, possible that railway can play a major role in hydrogen transportation. And provided the adequate safety measures are there, so that can be the new area for the railways to transport the hydrogen. So that will be looking forward, but that I think will take a longer time to get mature. Uh, uh, it requires a lot of industry support and everything will be required. Okay. And, and any any priority areas you're also thinking regarding to the freight also? I mean, we have you have covered about the passenger transport, but any any priority areas you're also thinking related to freight? No, no you know, we for a freight plane, we are operating almost uh, trying to work almost say 9000 ton uh, of a train. So uh, operating that level of uh, train with the hydrogen fuel cell will definitely require a large number of storage uh, in the uh, train in the locomotive itself, which first of all, it will not be possible. And then if we provide it, it will be a very short uh, range of operation. And probably uh, since we are having a power, green power from the overhead wires, so if we are having a green power, then probably 
carrying with the hydrogen will not carry any meaning because whatever the losses, the conversion conversion efficiency is there, so that will come into play. So probably will go will not uh, go for any freight train operation. Objective is wherever we do not have electrification, where we have a emergency kind of operation or where we have some islanding of of it, islanding of a trains. So there we would like to switch to this uh, hydrogen. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Sena. Pawan, uh, I will quickly come to you, and uh, I will. Uh, this may not be directly related with what you have presented, but since you were presenting related to the future scenarios for the hydrogen in India, I would just like to ask. We have all understood and read about what Mukesh Ambani, Mr. Mukesh Ambani said about in the climate summit that uh, one is the less than uh, rupee, less than a dollar for the hydrogen, green hydrogen in in the coming years, and also he also mentioned about. That India has a capacity to produce thousand gigawatt of uh, renewable energies, uh, and that just only taking 0.5 percent of land mass, right? I just want to understand if there are any, uh, as, I mean, a relation uh, or understanding between, I mean, how this large scale electrolyzers be placed accordingly to to actually get into this, uh, I mean, uh, how the installation should happen in 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 relation to that. Yeah. Thank you, Sirish. I think a very pertinent question when we are talking about uh, where would we produce hydrogen, right? Basically, you are asking that. So I think one thing we need to understand is that the um, I was also talking in my slide briefly that the offshore wind, gen sorry, the onshore wind uh, generation in renewable happens in Tamil Nadu and Gujarat. And when we are talking about solar, dominantly it's in Rajasthan, Maharashtra, Telangana, and MP. You know they have more than one one and a half gigawatt, and a lot of projects are coming in pipeline. So the question is uh, looking at two points. One is there is coast with uh, Tamil Nadu, Gujarat, Maharashtra, but in terms of water sources itself, where do you want, because you need water to generate hydrogen through electrolysis. So you have energy uh, to do the electrolysis, but to generate itself, you need water. So, you know, you can look at ex uh, neighboring states, maybe Madhya Pradesh, and I think we need to really look at this more in detail. And then the energy transmission itself is not, um, is quite possible with the green energy corridors or with the ISDS corridor where you can go the energy from one state to another and then you can really do think of you know where the electrolyzers should be placed. So I think we need to really look at the generation of the REs and the transmission line to really then talk about where the electrolysis will be, I mean electrolyzers will be uh, placed. And we also need to understand where this will be used specifically in the transportation sector itself. So I think it's the whole value chain that we are talking about, but these are some initial thoughts. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Mr. Tom, uh, one thing I, I would like to ask from you, you have covered about the transportation related to the use of, uh, I mean, the road transport and, and the challenges and the opportunities related to that. but. Do you think any, uh, shipping has also an important role to play in, in, in this? I mean, how we can uh, cover into this? How is well related, pertinent to safety? And uh, is, is there anything prominent role the shipping also has to play in this? Um, yes, uh, we, 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 you know, let us let me answer that in uh, two separate um, um, segments. You know, we, we are talking about earlier, we were talking about uh, cost of hydrogen, right? And we were talking about um, um, what is the price of hydrogen uh, through different mode of generation? What is more important is what is the price of hydrogen at the nozzle? And that is where I was saying, if we rely on hundreds of kilometers of hydrogen distribution through um, through you know, gaseous uh, cylinder cascades or even two trailers, that trans transportation or the shipping cost is going to play a significant role in that uh, cost of hydrogen at the at the dispensing nozzle, cost of generation could be less than one dollars per kilogram. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of the SMRs in the country are producing hydrogen at less than one kilo you know, one dollar per kilogram. Um, so the, the transportation is is where all the or the shipping is where all the you know um, all the cost is going to um, accumulate. And going back to the Indian Railways project, um, again, I, if you look at what um, what is happening elsewhere in the train programs, uh, that is why you know the the large volume hydrogen demand is met through uh, liquid source, not through the gaseous source. And 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 um, the president rightfully said uh, some of the limitations uh, they face 
is because of the quantity of fuel they can carry on board. And you can increase that significantly by going to the liquid state. And um, there are two liquefiers here in, uh, in India, uh, but they are small, managed by ISRO. Uh, but as the Indian railway programs you know, go forward, uh, you may need more uh, liquefiers. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, thank oh. you. I think. Yeah, uh, can can I ask one question from the Tom? Basically, the liquefier, uh, what you are saying, the storage can be the liquid form. I I think that will increase the capacity of the hydrogen tremendously. So, uh, but it will require a very high pressure in that case, or we need a cryogenic pressure to store that kind of a liquid. Uh, so, what what is the cost implication? Will it be quite high? Otherwise, if that's the solution, well, why why do a large transportation? Yeah, so, so the liquid transportation is at lower pressure. OK, uh, liquefaction takes a lot of energy, I agree. But the liquid hydrogen is transported at less than two bar. The, the, the liquid hydrogen storage systems and the trailers I have shown you there, they all operate less than uh, 12 bar. The reason for that is the 12 bar is the, you know, in, I, I need to say the PSI. In a 172 PSI is the critical pressure of hydrogen. So we keep you know, hydrogen in the liquid form um, below the critical pressure of 172 PSI, which is about um, 12 bar, I believe. Um, so uh, it, it's a very low pressure transportation. And as you rightfully said, it carries a much larger volume. And again, going back to the numbers I was showing on the screen, when a gas trailer transports about uh, 300 kilograms of hydrogen at um, uh, about 200 bar, that liquid trailer you saw there is transporting about 5,000 kilograms of hydrogen at uh, less than uh, 10 bar. So that is the analogy you can look at. So all of a sudden, you know, you can transport much larger volume. But then the challenge will be for the capital intensive and energy intensive um, installations for liquefying hydrogen. But as that is what I said. That is not going to be in the near future. Uh, but for programs like Indian Railways, where they are planning to use about 10 you know, tons in one month, or 60 tons in six months, um, supplied through uh, gaseous mode will be a major bottleneck. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Tom. And uh, uh, so we will, uh, I'm so sorry, we have extended the session to a lot. Uh, but so we, we will end this session now. We'll answer to all of the questions separately to all the participants and attendees. and. Uh, uh, we'll make we'll meet another 15 minutes to the same link and we'll have the follow up sessions on the global uh, development in hydrogen based mobility and the incentives and the regulation for rolling out hydrogen based transportation systems. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for joining and, and please uh, stay for the complete. Uh, I mean, next two sessions only will after 15 minutes break at 1415. We'll meet again. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.